Okay, good evening and welcome to Science Pub. On this uh, Sunday night, our first ever election debate special. And uh, we thank you very much for coming out. We know you had a choice and we think you made the right choice. I think you're actually going to learn something and uh, be much, I think you are the smart people out here today. Um, just a bit about the Science Pub. Um, I'd like to go over the fact that we're nonprofit. Um, we'd like to stimulate interest in science and education with speakers giving topics in a casual setting. Um, everybody involved with the Science Pub is a volunteer. In fact, I'd like to thank the Science Pub volunteers right now. Let's hear it. Uh, can we get some applause? Thank you very much. Also, thank you to Taproot for hosting us. We really, really appreciate you guys coming. Uh, we realize, realize it's a little small tonight. Again, maybe because of the election debate, I don't know. But we really appreciate your donations. They keep us going. They allow us to keep doing Science Pub, get the supplies that we need to keep it moving and looking for speakers. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers. We post meetings on uh, Facebook and Meetup, so if you're ever interested about topics or about helping out, then that's a good way to contact us or to even just show up and, and help out. That would be great. Um, if you have suggestions, we're definitely open for those. We're always looking for speakers and topics and suggestions. Tonight we have uh, Miss Morelia will discuss doing archaeology at the nexus of ancient migration routes. And we'll have an introduction after the trivia. <coughs> we'll have some question and answer after the presentation tonight as well. And November, just want to go over, we have a uh, presentation. It's going to be growing foam insulation, I believe, from fungi. And December is going to be a presentation about epidemiology. A little bit more on that when we get a little closer. Uh, so we will start with the trivia. Okay, so tonight Rita Moralia will talk about the archaeological archaeology of a site near the southeast side of Lake Iliamna. The site that has been investigated many times since 1997. The remains of houses, pottery, and other discoveries will help us learn about ancient life. Rita Moralia is an archaeologist who has worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs for 17 years. Previously, she worked as a social anthropologist for the state of Alaska, fish and game, and as a cultural resource specialist following the Exxon Valdez spill. She holds a master's in anthropology with a concentration in archaeology. And please, uh, some applause for Rita. You've got to get kind of close to it to make it work. Okay. I'm going to try to make this work here. Can everyone hear me? Good? Okay. I'm going to hope that this works. I'm an archaeologist with the Bureau of Indian Affairs here in Anchorage. And when I say I'm an archaeologist, people often get the wrong idea. So just to be clear, Dr. Indiana Jones is not a real archaeologist. <laughs> I find rain gear and a survey vest are a lot more practical for field work in Alaska than a leather jacket and a fedora. So why does the government have archaeologists? Uh, there were early efforts towards historic preservation at the federal level, including the 1906 Antiquities Act, the 1935 Historic Sites Act, and the 1949 National Trust for Historic Preservation Act. However, it is Section 106 of the 1966 National Historic Preservation Act, which requires federal agencies to evaluate the impact of any federally funded or federally permitted projects on historic properties, including historic and archaeological sites and structures. The Act created the National Register of Historic Places, a list of national historic landmarks, as well as state historic preservation offices. The Act was a response to concerns raised by rapid development of cities and highways during the 1960s, which had resulted in the loss of many important historic sites and structures including Pennsylvania Station in New York City, built in 1910 and demolished in 1963. Implementation of the legislation created many jobs for archaeologists in government as well as in the private sector. 
In Alaska, archaeologists with the Bureau of Indian Affairs Regional Archaeology Office are primarily involved with applying Section 106 to Alaska native allotments and federally restricted native town site lots. If the landowner wants to sell or lease their property or do construction using federal funds, we have to determine whether or not there is an historic or archaeological site on the property. If there is a site, we need to evaluate whether or not it is eligible for inclusion on the National Register of Historic Places. And it's important to note that sites on Alaska Native allotments are protected from excavation without a permit from BIA by the Archaeological Resources Protection Act of 1979. If there is an eligible site on the property, we work in consultation with the landowner, the Alaska State Historic Preservation <laughs> Officer, and other interested parties, which might include the local tribe, to determine appropriate mitigation measures. The idea is to allow the landowner to do what they want to do with their land while preserving the information from the site, though this does not necessarily mean preserving the site itself. Sometimes mitigation takes the form of a publication, and I brought an example of that type of mitigation. Uh, a publication on a historic railroad station that lies on an Alaska Native allotment on the Seward Peninsula near Nome. Um, I did bring a few free copies. I think people already took those and you know, if people are interested and didn't get one, just come see me after the talk. Sometimes it is determined that it's appropriate to mitigate by excavation of the site, as was the case with the primary example I'll be discussing today. Any artifacts recovered from an Alaska Native allotment belong to the allottee or to the landowner who can decide to keep them, donate them to a museum, or to leave them in the care of BIA. What kinds of sites and objects are we most likely to find in Alaska? No. <laughs> we don't tend to find golden idols. We're more likely to find pottery, stone tools, both chip stone and ground stone, historic structures and features, historic trash dumps, midden sites, which are basically prehistoric trash deposits, culturally modified trees, historic cemetery sites, and prehistoric cemetery sites. And by the way, Alaska Native graves and village sites, oh, excuse me, Alaska Native graves and cemeteries are protected from disturbance by both state and federal laws. We find house pits and village sites, and we find caribou fences. There's not much in the way of monumental architecture in the prehistoric record in Alaska. Many of the places we work in are pretty remote, and the challenges of field work include logistics, <laughs> weather, large wild animals, hostile vegetation, <laughs> and clouds of vicious insects. Today I'll be talking about a small site located at the southeastern end of Lake Iliamna at what was the intersection of the territories of the Pacific and southwestern mainland Eskimo in the late 19th century. The site was excavated under the direction of Sean Mack, who's here to keep me honest. Uh, many of his, these are his slides and his, his conclusions, um, but I did participate in the excavation and I took some of the photos. While much of the work is Sean's, any errors in this presentation are undoubtedly mine. <laughs> the site is comprised of one or two house depressions, numerous cash pits, and an activity area located on a point of land which juts between the Iliamna region's Copper River and a slough flowing from Pike Lake. The area is host to a large run of red salmon, world-class rainbow trout fishing, and abundant waterfowl populations, as well as to a large population of grizzly bears. Uh, and it's an, it's an ideal location for fishing and hunting. But what makes the site especially interesting archaeologically is its geographic location of one of, at one of only two possible portage points from Bristol Bay to the east. This makes it a potential conduit for cultural influences 
between the interior, Kachemak Bay, Bristol Bay, and Kodiak Island. The site was initially visited by B.I. Eric Geologist in 1997. Two test pits were excavated, producing a lot of pottery sherds, and the two color photos at the bottom show pots partially reconstructed from the recovered sherds. The black and white photos at the top show similar pottery vessels from other sites in the Naknek area. The shape is characteristic of pots from the Naknek drainage designated Brooks River Weir Thin Plain Weir, generally dated to circa 100 to 600 AD. BIA revisited the site in 2013 to conduct site testing and mapping. Here is one of the test excavations. The white band close to the top is almost certainly an ash layer from the 1912 Novarupta eruption, previously known as the Katmai eruption. The thick tan band is probably also an ash layer, though we have not run down an association for that one. The 2013 field visit resulted in the conclusion that there was one definite house depression, as well as a second possible house depression, several cash pits, and an activity area, area at the point, which was a chipping station or a place where one or more persons sat making chipstone tools. We found both stone flakes and stone tools that were broken in their manufacture in the tests on the point. We returned to excavate one of the house depressions in 2014. The excavated house was rectangular, measuring approximately 4.3 by 3.3 meters, with an apparent tunnel entrance in one of the longer sides. The other possible house depression is slightly smaller and less definite in outline. The site location required protection from local fauna, including an electrified bear fence and bug tents. Here are a few slides of the excavation in progress, beginning with removing the sod layer and on to excavation. The information from the excavation was carefully recorded. We moved a lot of dirt. We screened the dirt from the excavations to catch smaller uh, artifacts that might otherwise be missed. A possible hearth feature was discovered in one of the tests. And archaeologists like hearths because they, they contain charcoal, which can be radiocarbon dated. This shows the Yep, that's the wrong one. There we go. This shows the extent of excavations in 2014. Once the excavation was complete, we recorded the site profiles. And I, I'm going to, yeah, I don't know how to go back. The other one I had there uh, was showing the bottom of one of the excavation units. And I wanted to mention that the cultural deposits were as much as a meter deep at this site. Should go, if you did that, it should go back. That one? Yeah, it should. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so that just shows the depth of the excavation. Once the excavation was complete, we recorded the site profiles. So before the 2014 excavations, we knew that the site contained pottery that looked like Norton pottery matching the Brooks River Weir style, and that the house was similar to the Brooks River Weir house and that the site appeared to represent a single occupation. Based on these comparisons, we expected to find that the site was occupied sometime between 1,000 and 2,000 years before present. We found some worked wood and approximately 50 pieces of pottery, as well as bits of calcined or burned bone, all of it too fragmentary to allow identification as to species. We did not find much in the way of diagnostic artifacts. One complete ground slate point, which Kodiak archaeologist Patrick Saltonstall indicated looks like a Koniak style point. We found the base of a second slate point, some chipped stone, and lots of stone debitage, which is what archaeologists call the waste flakes created in the chipping of stone tools. The raw material used to make the stone tools and flakes found is remarkably varied including slate, quartz, agate, chert, rhyolite, and argillite, and that's consistent with what other archaeologists found at another site at nearby Pedro Bay, which is also uh, in Ileana Lake. However, it is important to note that none of these raw materials are present in the immediate vicinity of the site. The agate and quartz may come from a place called Agate Beach in Intricate Bay within Ileana Lake, 
which is several miles away from the site. It is likely that the ground slate came to the site from Kodiak via trade, and it may have been fashioned into a projectile point on Kodiak and traded as a completed implement. The original point would have been longer. The fact that this point was resharpened for reuse points to its value and scarcity. And, and the reason we know that, that it would have been longer is you, if you look at the pyramidal shape of the point, it probably would have started out with just a, you know, a, a more, a steeper point and not, and that pyramidal shape comes from the sharpening. Uh, the fact that this point was resharpened for reuse points to its value and scarcity, strengthening the argument that it was, uh, it arrived here in trade from another region. We believed that all of the material culture we had found pointed to a Norton occupation, would have, which would have meant that the site was between 1,000 and 2,000 years old. But the average radiocarbon date based on charcoal samples taken from the excavated house is much later than expected. Roughly 645 plus or minus 30 years BP or years before present, meaning the site was likely, likely occupied sometime between AD 1280 and AD 1395. And that's much more recently than we expected. Archaeologist Don Dumond has since indicated that he has seen pottery similar to that found in our site in sites on the Alaska Peninsula as late as 300 BP, although this information wasn't available to us earlier as it has not been published. So the presence of the pottery in our site does not indicate a later continuation of the Norton tradition as we had previously thought. This is roughly where the site would fall in the established time frames for the sur surrounding areas. We returned to the site in 2015 to conduct additional excavations. More work was done on the house, which meant we had to find our site grid from the previous field season. A test unit was also excavated into one of the cash pits, which produced these pieces of pottery which are consistent with the type of pottery that had been found at the site previously. A unit was excavated below the house, which produced another possible hearth feature. In 2015, we found more ground slate. A unit was also excavated on the point of land overlooking the confluence of the Copper River and the Slough from Pike Lake, which produced several chipstone implements, including this tiny projectile point that appears to be made of a cloudy quartz with some sort of intrusions. And uh, the photos show both sides of the same artifact. We found projectile point fragments. This one looks like it's made of rhyolite to me. It appears to have been broken at the base, but there's retouch indicating that it may have been intended for reuse. This tip fragment is made from a fine grain siliceous stone or chert. This appears to be a projectile point that was never completed. It's much thicker than the others found in the same unit and may have been discarded before any thinning, thinning flakes were struck from it. And it may be made of argillite. This may be an incomplete projectile point or it could also have been a knife. Uh, it may have been broken in manufacture and discarded. It's also made of a coarse grain stone, perhaps argillite. There was one surprise in the radiocarbon dates from the 2015 charcoal samples. While the excavated house and the cash pit area are still firmly dated to 645 plus or minus 30 years BP, charcoal from the point where the chipstone tools came from returned a substantially earlier date, 1,850 plus or minus 30 years BP, indicating that the chipping station was used sometime between AD 60 and AD 215 more than a thousand years before the house was occupied. So it turns out we have a two component site after all. This site sums up the cultural influences on the Copper River Iliamna site as far as they are currently known. Circa 1850 BP, the time of the chipping station, the Norton tradition represented by the green is widespread both to the north and on the Alaska Peninsula and the Kachemak tradition represented by the tan 
dominates the Kodiak Archipelago, the Lower Kenai Peninsula, and Prince William Sound to the south and the east. This shows the cultural influences on the site at the time the house was occupied. By this time, both Thule traits, represented by the blue, and Athabascan traits from the north are seen influencing the Kodiak tradition in the Kodiak Archipelago. The site is at the intersection of all of these cultural influences. After the site was abandoned, and following a volcanic event circa 600 BP, Thule influenced Kodiak traits moved to the north. You may wonder why I've presented information on an excavation run by someone else. In our office, we're sort of randomly assigned to take the lead on sites. When I was invited to present here, the first thing I thought of was doing a presentation on the historic railroad station near Nome because I had just finished editing the publication on that. But the reaction I got was puzzlement and the question came up of whether or not archaeology is a science. In the end it was agreed that I could present if I talked about a prehistoric site and since by the luck of the draw I have yet to run an excavation on a prehistoric site, I borrowed Sean's. However, the question of whether or not archaeology is a science stayed in my mind. There's been a debate on this very question among archaeologists for decades, and the answer is not simple. In the late 1950s, there began a movement towards what was called new archaeology, now also referred to as processual archaeology. The movement had its genesis in the book Method and Theory in American Archaeology by Gordon Willey and Philip Phillips published in 1958. To broadly generalize, up until this time, archaeologists saw their role as doing little more than cataloging and describing what they found and creating timelines. The proponents of new archaeology believed that with the rigorous application of the scientific method, they could get past the limits of the archaeological record to reach a broader understanding of the life and culture of the societies that left the sites behind. Colin Renfrew, a proponent of the new archaeology, stated in 1987 that archaeology had, quote, learnt to speak with greater authority and accuracy about the ecology of past societies, their technology, their economic basis, and their social organization. Now it is beginning to interest itself in the ideology of early communities, their religions, the way they express rank, status, and group identity, end quote. A key assertion of the new archaeology was that the strict adherence to the scientific method would result in objective interpretations of the archaeological record. One very, uh, one very positive outcome of the new archaeology was something called ethnoarchaeology, in which archaeologists embraced the anthropological method of living with and studying similarly adapted modern groups in order to better understand prehistoric cultures. The most famous proponent of this type of research, Lewis Binford, studied the people of Anaktuvik Pass, Alaska, in order to help in the interpretation of Ice Age artifacts from France. While the new archaeology was still very new, in the 1970s and 1980s, another theoretical movement arose in response to it, which is generally called post-processual archaeology. The proponents of the post-processual movement were most critical of the idea that a strict adherence to the scientific method resulted in an objective interpretation of the scientific re method, or record, excuse me. They contend that, contended that the bias of the archaeologists interpreting the site always intruded into the interpretation, and that no matter how rigorously scientific the analysis was, its interpretation was always subjective at best. At worst, the post-processualists contended, and I'm going to quote Wikipedia here because I couldn't sum it up any better, quote, the positivist approach of the processualists in holding that only that which could be sensed, tested, and predicted was valid, only sought to produce technical knowledge that facilitated the oppression of ordinary people by elites. And that, by putting forward the concept that human societies were irresistibly shaped by external influences and pressures, archaeologists were tacitly accepting social injustice." End quote. 
Ian Hodder, a leader in the post-processualist movement, asserted that, anthropolo that archaeologists had no right to interpret the prehistory of other cultural groups, but should rather allow members of those groups to interpret their own prehistory. The post-processualists characterized the practitioners of the new archaeology as being both ethically and politically irresponsible, a charge that stunned those who thought they were just trying to be objective. Unsurprisingly, some people took these accusations very personally. While attending a conference in archaeological theory during my graduate school years, I had the disorienting experience of witnessing an incensed advocate of the new archaeology call a post-processualist colleague a Nazi for his criticisms of the new archaeology. But the post-processualists do have a point. Archaeology has been used to support political ideologies and movements. The most famous example of this is Mussolini, who sponsored archaeological excavations and used the idea of a return to the glory of Rome to support the rise of fascism in Italy. However, there are still those who question the value of the application of post-processual theory in archaeology. While doing research for this talk, I came across this photo with the following text on a satirical blog called RTP. Quote, leading proponents of post-processual archaeology were last night trying desperately to resuscitate the bloated corpse of archaeological theory in the wake of a wave of backlash against the forced categorization and unnecessary over-intellectualization which has characterized archaeology since the demise of the new archaeology, end quote. For the most part, the use of the scientific method in archaeology has continued, though in the United States the interpretation of the data is done with a nod towards post-processualism. In Alaska, archaeological theory is seldom mentioned. However, the presence of living Alaska Native cultures, combined with the fact that Section 106 explicitly encourages consultation with native tribes and other interested parties, creates an environment that lends itself to collaboration with native tribes, institutions, and individuals. Such cross-cultural collaboration can lead to the presentation of alternative interpretations of archaeological data, which is similar to the approach promoted by the post-processualists. In addition, some Alaskan archaeologists most notable among them, Ernest or Tiger Birch, incorporated Alaska Native oral history into their interpretations of the archaeological re record. Far from casual storytelling, Alaska Native oral history is a carefully curated tradition passed down from generation to generation. Tiger Birch demonstrated the stunning level of accuracy of oral history going back hundreds of years and found that it was very useful in the interpretation of the archaeological record. In addition, archaeology in Alaska interfaces with several scientific disciplines, including physics, geology, biology, and mathematics. Archaeology as practiced today makes use of the scientific method. Excavations are carried on in a way that maximizes the collection of data. This is done partly in recognition of the fact that archaeological excavation results in the destruction of the site. In the course of excavation, the contextual information, including site features, are destroyed. If the contextual information is not recorded as data, that information is lost. Sites are excavated using a grid system, and artifacts and site fe features are carefully mapped with the locations of important and diagno or diagnostic artifacts three-point provenienced. In addition to plan view maps, the stratigraphic information from the walls of the excavation, known as site profiles, are also recorded and described. The profile provides information about how the site was formed over time by both cultural and geologic processes. It can provide information about what the site was used for, and may also help to date the site. For example, if the site lies just beneath a volcanic ash layer that has already been assigned a deposition date by geologists, we know that it predates that ash fall. 
The site's stratigraphy can also provide information about how long a site was occupied or whether there was more than one occupation or use of the site. All of this careful recording is to, to allow the reconstruction of structures and activity areas, the goal, ultimate goal being to learn more about the life ways of the people who use the site than can be found in the artifacts as divorced from their context. To this end, samples of various site materials are collected for various kinds of analyses. Most commonly, charcoal is collected for radiocarbon dating. And the dating itself is generally done by physicists. This is one of the many ways in which archaeology is practiced today re relies on specialists in the hard sciences. Other methods used to determine the dates of archaeological sites or artifacts include thermoluminescence dating of pottery and obsidian hydration used to date volcanic glass. Dendrochronology is the dating method based on comparing the width of a series of growth rings on wood found in archaeological sites with a known sequence of growth rings for a particular region. In Alaska, culturally modified trees can be dated by taking a wedge from the scar lobe on a living tree, as has been done here, and counting the annual growth rings that have been added since the tree was scarred. Pollen samples may be collected from archaeological sites to allow for a reconstruction of the environment at the time the site was occupied, as well as to provide information on the diet and subsistence <coughs> practices of the site occupants. Mathematics, primarily in the form of statistics, is used in various ways in archaeology. Statistical sampling is often used in archaeological surveys of large areas. Only a sample of the area will be surveyed and tested on the ground, with the results being extrapolated to the whole area. It is also popular to do, to do multivariate an analyses of tool, mor tool morphology, either across cultures through time or both. The source of obsidian can be determined using X-ray fluorescence to obtain a profile of trace elements and comparing it with that of obsidian from known sources. The obsidian flake shown here came from a site on the, the Unalakleet River. And obsidian is not found naturally in that area. There's no volcanoes in the area. The flake shown here was much too small for analysis, but a chunk of obsidian from the same site was sourced to Batsilnitas in the Atna region, which is 500 miles away from where it was found. The obsidian almost certainly reached the site on the Unalakleet via ancient trade routes. In recent decades, genetics has been used in, to both support and refute long-held long -held theories concerning migration, most notably in the Aleutian Islands, where it was previously argued that there were separate long-headed and broad-headed prehistoric populations. An analysis of ge genetic samples from both living and prehistoric human populations has shown that both long-headed and broad-headed groups together form a single population. Archaeologists intersect with biology in many other ways as well. The most prominent example is in the identification and analysis of bone, both human and animal, found in archaeological sites. These are usually separate specializations within archaeology, human osteology, and faunal analysis. With the cold temperatures in the far north, frozen human remains or animal remains are sometimes encountered in archaeological sites creating an opportunity to learn more about diet, life ways, and general health. One such example is in the Okyakvik village site in Barrow, Alaska. Frozen human remains were found in a 400-year-old sod ho or house, wooden house, which was believed to have collapsed on the occupants while they were sleeping. One of the bodies was so well preserved that it was possible to conduct an autopsy. And all of this work was done in consultation with elders in Barrow, and the remains were reburied in accordance with the, their wishes following the autopsy. Unsurprisingly, remote sensing in the form of satellite imagery is very useful in finding archaeological sites that have any kind of surface expression, including those that are marked so solely by subtle variations in vegetation. <coughs> It is a lot easier to stand at a desk looking at a satellite image than it is to tromp around on tundra for several days. 
Ground penetrating imagery is now used to map certain kinds of sites without excavation. This is especially useful in situations where excavation is not an option, such as identifying the limits of a cemetery that needs to be avoided in a highway expansion project. So back to the original question, is archaeology a science? In my opinion, archaeologists are storytellers. Our main source material is the archaeological record. We do our best to craft our stories to fit what we find in the ground, but these stories are informed by our own perspective and experience. Since for the most part, it is Alaska native culture that archaeologists in Alaska are telling stories about, it behooves us to include Alaska native perspectives. I believe that the scientific method is useful in archaeology, but I also think that it has its limits and that complete objectivity is not possible in the interpretation of the archaeological record. Perhaps the best we can do is be self-critical. Self we can explore and be honest about our own biases and assumptions. Collaboration with Alaska Natives and the inclusion of alternative interpretations in our work is also a step in the right direction. As irritating as it can be for some people to accept that there is no way that we can unequivocally reach the one and only truth in the interpretation of the archaeological record. The acknowledgement that there may be multiple, equally valid interpretations gets us closer to reality. Finally, I believe that archaeology is an art. It's an art which makes use of the scientific method and relies on specialists in the hard sciences. Thank you. So if there's any uh, questions, we'll do some question and answer for a few minutes here with uh, Rita, and then we'll move on to the uh, trivia answers. Thanks. Any questions? How is the transition from something being a litter or junk to an archaeological artifact determined? Like, is a mural, a junk card, an artifact? If, if, if possible, can we uh, repeat the questions? And I think that if I understood correctly, the question was, when does something go from just being a thing to being an artifact or an archaeological site? And for the kind of work I do, we tend to define that in accordance with the law, which defines it as you know 50 years old. Um, I think a site has to be 50 years old to be protected under the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, so that's the rule of thumb that we use. Um, and there, there are sometimes exceptions to that, um, but generally, under the law, that that is, you know, that is what we use as our rule of thumb. Does it have to be buried? <laughs> Most of the time, yeah. Well, that's, that's another criteria. But it has not to be below ground. It has to be buried. You have to excavate it. Right. Right. My car in the driveway doesn't. Count, right? right, but al although a lot of what we end up doing um, all in a lot of the Section 106 work <coughs> involves things that are still above ground and aren't buried yet. Or, did some of my colleagues want to answer that? The, the, the railroad book that we just right. read, that that's an above ground structure. Those were yeah. you know, railroads. That's that my boss there, that's Sean. But, but they're, they're, they're not buried, they're still above ground. Very eligible for the National Register. Right. Spinard. Right, exactly. And, and Spinard, could, uh, Spinard could be eligible as a, a you know, historic district. If it has to be modified. So if the building's over 50 years old, okay. it has to be modified. It hasn't been modified. Okay, that's right. right. Or substantially. And we're kind of talking about apples and oranges there because there are historic sites, and archaeological sites can also be considered historic sites, or they are historic sites not all historic sites are archaeological. So that was, there's kind of, yeah, two different things there. Anybody else? Would Kenneth Houghton McCarthy be just historical rather than archaeological? Is there still function there? Although, um, I bet if we went to can you, can you McCarthy the and we put in a square, we would find historic artifacts underground. Yeah. 
I, I would bet, I mean, um, um, you know, Kennecott is, it, I think Kennecott is on the National Register. Uh, it's a National Register site. It might be also a National Historic Landmark. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I, I would bet that there are also things underground. And that's very often the case with historic sites because um, the archaeological, the, the leaves that are falling right now, they turn into soil over time. And deposition is, is always occurring. And ground disturbance is always occurring. So archaeological sites are getting formed around us all the time. It just happens very slowly. Can you broaden that a little bit to the Yogiana region in general? I understand some of the sites along the Bering Sea are over 7,000 years old. Yeah? I, I guess I missed what the so question was. I mean, we're talking about sites in, that you mentioned that were only about one to 2,000. Right. Oh, there are much, much older sites in Alaska but than I mean, here in Lake Illinois. Um, and I don't, do you know more about that, John? Uh, well, I'm sorry, what was the question? Older sites in the Iliamna region. You know, I think Iliamna was deglaciated around six or 7,000 years ago. Uh, now, there's <coughs> older sites closer to Bristol Bay uh, that are closer to like eight to 10,000 years old, but like Iliamna Lake itself, I don't think was deglaciated uh, until so I think that's about the oldest that have been found. But early on, it hasn't been looked at really. I mean, the site that we looked at uh, at Pipe Lake, and then like there was the Pedro Bay, and that's about it in terms of prehistoric. Uh, so there, there really isn't a baseline for prehistoric data that we found that, that gives you a, a, a late date. And, and that's why we need more archaeology. Was everybody able to hear what Sean said? Okay, yeah, side hand up over here. You, you mentioned the story record. Where does, where did your sites in the area of the story record? I, I didn't quite get, I didn't quite get the gist of your question. What were your stories in the native story record about the site? And we have not done, we need to look at the oral history on that. Oral history. We, we, we haven't looked into that in that particular case, no. And, and you know, part, this is part of you know what we do. We have like so many sites we need to look at, or places we need to go in the course of a year. That there's a lot of stuff we would love to do that we end up not having time for. Was this site picked because of the public project, or did somebody do a dog, or did somebody just say, "Let's go out here and check the site out"? It had to do with um, a request of the landowner. Oh, okay. So yeah, it didn't have to do with a larger project. Yes? Is there an interface, whether through uh, DIA or through State of Alaska, that sort of shows what's been completed for uh, archaeology research in Alaska, sort of an overview to see how much of it's been completed? Well, um, the, the uh, State Historic Preservation Office keeps records, and there is a database. Um, so all of all of the archaeological work that gets done in Alaska is supposed to be reported to them, and that is, you know, that they are the they are the ones that keep the records. Yeah. Uh, could you expand a little bit more on the intersectionality of like native oral histories as uh, intersecting with archaeology? Okay. The question is. Um, Wanted me to expand a little bit more on the inter interactions between uh, native oral history and archaeology. Um, you know, and I did mention Tiger Birch um, in his work. You know, the, I guess I could talk a little bit about the stuff that I've done specifically. You know, in my career, uh, which included working with native elders in Prince William Sound on um, their place names and um, native place names in general they tend to be descriptive and they can help you understand what people were doing at a particular site. Sometimes they just describe how the land looks or how the place looks, but sometimes they describe what people were doing there. The, the, the name might relate to a particular resource at that spot. Um, sometimes archaeologists also can use place name maps um, They'll go and look for the sites where there are identified place names. Um, 
And so there's a lot of information that is preserved in Native oral histories. I, at one point I went to a, um, an Alaska Historical Society conference where Katie John was speaking, who was, was an Athabascan elder, and she was a storyteller and she was raised as a storyteller. She talks about how as a child she was told the stories and then she had to repeat them back to the people who were teaching them to her. She had to repeat them word for word exactly as they were told to her. And she talked about how when she was falling asleep at night, she'd be thinking over the stories in her head night after night. And so it, it's not, you know, what we may think of as like, you know, ghost stories around a campfire or something. Um, the, there are oral traditions that were, you know, very, very strictly handed down word for word. Um, and so that, that was the main point I was trying to get across, was that people should think of it that way. It's, it's, it's as close as you could get to a written tradition without writing, without having writing without writing things down. Frida, can I say something? Sure. Okay, so there's, there's a great example, a great story that I tell my students um, that was documented by Julie Kirkpin, who's a Kenyan Native American historian, and she talks about how she was um, Um, and one of the, the oral histories that she documented was a story of a young girl calling a glacier down and destroying the village. And everybody for the longest time had treated this as just this fantastical story of like, oh, a girl can't call a village down, that's ridiculous, or, or call a glacier down, that's ridiculous. And then archaeologists and geologists went to where the story says this village was, and at that point the glacier had started receding and it actually uncovered the village. And the archaeologists excavated it, and then the geologists came and said, no, this was, I think it's called a running glacier. Like, it's a rare glaciological glace event, but the glacier can move very, very quickly and advance very, very quickly, and it did, in fact, crush that village. And so the oral history of the girl calling the village and it being destroyed was supported. So it's not, you know, did a young girl call it? We don't have any way to projectile point that appears to have come from Kodiak by trade. Um, that's the main one. Can you think of anything else, Sean, that you got out of that? Yeah, well, I mean, just uh, the artifacts in general tell that kind of story. Uh, usually with, uh, at least in the past, the archaeologists kind of club culture groups based on like things like house type, uh, tool technology, uh, pottery, like what, what they're producing. So the site in Ileonda uh, kind of showed multiple culture types. Uh, out on Kodiak, they were doing a lot of round slate at the time. Uh, what we found at the site was they were producing a lot of chip stone tools, and then we found ground slate points. So it's kind of like, well, the only place producing ground slate at the time is Kodiak. You know, Crystal Bay area, they're doing pottery. We find a little bit of that. So it's like, it just kind of continued that narrative of, of culture contact, all these ideas moving around. So, I mean, if you measure between Kodiak and Bristol Bay, I mean, what is that, six, seven hundred miles? Uh, mm -hmm. And you're kind of right in the middle of that in Illinois. Like, it's, I mean, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it continues, I guess. And then there's still a question of where some of those raw materials came from, although that's a question that we haven't figured out the answer to. Yeah, I think we're good. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, that's, uh,
Rita for the uh, Rita for the, for the topic. And I'd also like to present Rita with a gift certificate for the tap room. Thank you. Thank you so much. And a glass. With an alcohol molecule on the side. Thank you so much.